Okay. Yes. So, sorry for the interruption. Uh, as I was saying, uh, let's start from which, what is our aim. So in our lab, we often have to deal with uh, reconstruction in 3D or 4D, if our models are diachronic, starting from historical sources. The idea is to take these historical sources and to model a situation in time or an evolution in time of a city. And in particular, today, we're going to show you what we did for two case studies. On one hand, Jerusalem, uh, between 1840 to 1940. So this is a diachronic uh, case study that uh, was created using a series of 10 uh, uh, maps. And Lausanne in the 17th century that instead was uh, created using uh, an historical maquette, so a model, an architectural model of the city. Uh, just to give you an idea of what we mean exactly when we talk of 4D models, this is an example of what we have been created in the past years by extracting information from maps and uh, uh, modeling this evolution of the city in these 100 years. But what you see here was, uh, let's say, the starting point of our current research. In fact, this is actually a geometric model that in some ways loses a bit the information about all the layers uh, uh, that we actually have in our GIS file. This is, uh, uh, in this case, simple extrusions, but as we will show, we now have better ways of modeling the city and better way of storing these layers of information. So, there is also another problem when we talk about uh, urban reconstruction. Not only we don't want it to be just geometric, but also we have often to deal with uh, incomplete data. Because we are dealing with historical sources, it's very rare that we actually have all the information that we need to create a 3D model. And we need to deal with it because otherwise we could not produce the model. How do we do that? There is the issue of cultural specificity, because every city is unique. Every city needs uh, specific parameters uh, to be set up for the procedural modeling. And then there is the fact that it's very rare that 3D models are actually our final output. Normally, we would like to be able to modify them because it, it's actually not uncommon to stumble upon a new source or to decide to interpret it in a different way. And also, we are dealing with cities, so uh, it's very difficult to imagine to do manually this kind of work of going over every building, modeling it, and or extracting the vectors. Also, uh, last but not least, uh, everything we do is an interpretation, and we are aware of it. It's a subjective interpretation, it's, it's the result of a series of hypotheses. So we want to be able to trace that, to record that always. And that's why uh, in, our, in this work, we focused on uh, four leading uh, uh, chapters, let's say. We wanted our systems to be as automatic as possible, so that, the, let's say, the large scale could be solved. Also, we wanted the models to be generic, because we are aware that every city has different needs, but we wanted to make them as flexible as possible to be adapted to other cities. Also, since we are aware of the iterative nature of the problem, we want them to be editable. And then we want them to be informative. That is, the 3D we want to create has to be ultimately a 3D GIS file. It has to contain these additional layers of information inside of the 3D geometry. So this is how we propose to do so. This is the structure of the pipeline that we propose. Uh, and we suggest to, uh, in our project to imagine the pipeline as one li linear pipeline, which we call bootstrapping, and a second part, which we call refinement, that is instead circular. The idea that is that every one of us, when we are dealing with historical sources, we usually tend to create first, uh, let's say, a vectorized version of our data. And what we want to do is specifically to take historical sources, create a first vectorized data with layers of information, and create a first 3D model out of it. Then what we propose is to use this 3D model as a canvas for our work, and to imagine the 3D model as a geospatial database that can be refined in time when we want it to be refined. So as you have seen, our pipeline is based on an initial automatic vectorization of the historical maps. And the first step of uh, this vectorization is the recognition of the content that is available on the map. And this is done through supervised semantic segmentation. So in this process, the first steps consist in annotating a few samples, a few 
uh, patches on the map that usually represent roughly 5 to 10 percent of the global corpus. So in this case, for instance, we have to annotate two different kinds of entities. First, we have to annotate the instances, the geometries of the buildings themselves. And second, we have to annotate the built-up areas or classify them to differentiate them, for instance, for the road network or the inner courtyards. In the second stage, we are training a neural network, in this case, a DH segment-based uh, framework, uh, in order to replicate this task and slowly learn how to perform this semantic segmentation task on the images. And in the third phase, we can use this train neural network in order to infer the semantic segmentation uh, on uh, new map patches. So in this way, the neural networks perform 90 to 95% of this work of vectorization and allows to deal with the large scale of historical data. And the second step consists in vectorizing the map itself. So in this purpose, we were developing our own vectorization algorithm in order to avoid the limitations from the current uh, algorithms for vectorization, mainly to try to have polygons that are totally adjacent and that shares the corners so that we don't have holes or we don't have overlap between the different buildings, which is obviously extremely important. And second, in order to per perform an, ev an efficient procedural modeling, we have to simplify the edges uh, agree agreeing with these uh, constraints. Third, we are trying to gather and to attach to this vector model, we are trying to attach secondary sources. So in this case, for instance, we deal with secondary sources as uh, is uh, frequently found in the middle of the 20th century that are cartographic sources that are realized by architects or urbanism and that give information about the typology of the building or in this case, for instance, the roof type and the number of floors. So we segment these maps in a, in a similar way and we perform a spatial joint in order to gather this information on the vector data. So now comes the part of encoding, in the sense that, as I said, what we wanted was a 3D model that has all the layers of information of a GIS file. So we decided to go for an existing format, which is called CTJSON. It's a lightweight JSON encoding of CTGML. It's particularly easy to use compared to CTGML, and moreover, it's very open to extensions. And in fact, we actually needed extensions for a second, uh, the second part of our pipeline, that is the procedural modeling, since we actually wanted to allocate inside of our model all the information about the geometry itself, the appearance of the building. And in fact, this, the phase that comes after is the phase of procedural modeling. So the phase of uh, elaboration of the information of the footprint and its attributes to create 3D. In fact, we have um, an assumption, a core assumption to our uh, procedural modeling task. Uh, the idea that everything in the 3D geometry is the direct result of the combination between the footprints and a series of attributes. In other terms, if we were dealing with parametric architectures, our attributes are nothing more than parameters in this uh, procedural modeling tasks. And this is the kind of result that we get. Now we, uh, our uh, procedural modeling scripts arrive to uh, a level of detail of 2.1, following the conventional level of details for uh, these kind of representations. And in particular, this means that we have roof uh, with four possible roof types, heap, gable, flat roof, and domed roof. And in particular, the roofs are modeled with a higher level of detail of, let's say, a simple sloped surface or a flat surface, which is important for us, considering that in Jerusalem we have a very high number of buildings that have this particular uh, flat roof with a dome on top. And this is the result that we get in terms of quantity. For Jerusalem, we modeled more than 10,000 buildings, which are actually across time. Here you see the overall result. And uh, of course, this would have been a huge uh, manual effort if we had to do that manually. So now we finished the bootstrapping. We have uh, a 3D model of the city. And now we want to be able to refine it to continually add uh, sources and, um, and new information to the model. So for example, here we have, uh, so we developed actually a, a web interface. So the, the CTGSN team uh, made a very uh, efficient CTGSN viewer uh, for the web, which is called Ninja. And we took that code and we developed uh, an, a web application that allows us to edit the model 
and then relaunch the, the cluster you're modeling. So for example here, we have a building with a flat roof and we find a new source and realize that actually the roof is not flat, it's a heap roof, so with a, with a, um, with a heap roof. And so we, we save the new attribute, we launch the, the modeling update, it takes a bit of time, and then we have uh, our new model that is directly visible in the, in the interface. So here we did a really uh, quick example. So we just changed the attribute, but you can, can also add the source that you have and add a description why you made this change in the interface that allows to document the changes that you make. So here what we have, we have editability and also uh, the CTGSN team uh, made um, uh, a, a version uh, has a versioning uh, integrated to the CTGSN so that every change to the model is not just a batch change to the model, it is actually you keep track of the changes you make so, so that you can always see why and how things have been done and you can come back and so on. So th this really um, gives you flexibility to uh, iterate on your model and, and, and document it as you, as, you, as you work and of course since it's a web application, you can then open your model to collaboration. If you have like other researcher working on the same city and having other tools that you, you don't have, you can add them to the team and then it can, uh, can help you to, to actually continuously uh, augment the model. And, uh, okay, so we opened the presentation promising a generic pipeline, but until now we've only seen examples of Jerusalem and this is the moment where we see other examples. Uh, so what we've taken as a second case study is our home city of Lausanne, of which you see a model here. Uh, this model was created by the Historical City um, Museum there, and it's supposed to represent an uh, ideal state of the city roughly between the 16th and 17th century. Um, so what we've done is go and take many pictures of that, create a photogrammetric model out of it, and start to play with it. Um, so this is what you see on the left. This is an autophoto, that is the model seen from the top um, with everything perfectly flat on a 2D plane. And what we've done, this is the image on the center, is taking that, redrawing vectors on top of this so that each building has a different geometry. And then comes the third step in which we automatically extract through the combination of the vectors and the, the model, uh, the height of the building. Therefore, we have a very efficient way of creating a, a GIS um, file. Like we've shown you in, in the case of Jerusalem, we convert this GeoJSON into a CTJSON file through our encoder, and we can import it easily in our interface, uh, in our pipeline, and start doing what we've seen, that is, uh, edit the parametric models, model them automatically, et cetera, et cetera. So to conclude, let's see uh, actually how we uh, tried to tackle each one of the five problems that I underlined at the beginning. So we said that we have incomplete data. And what we decided to do to tackle this was to actually accept it and to say, in order to have a 3D representation, we will do infer, uh, an infer and assumptions and the idea is that we always keep track of that. Every time we infer a value, every time we have to guess it, we will keep track of that via metadata and paradata. Then there is the issue of cultural specificity. And in this case, we actually operate by making our procedural modeling scripts fully parameterizable. The idea is that no matter what characteristics the object has, uh, but let's say uh, if the roof type has a specific slope, it's, a pos it's possible to uh, personalize this and to change it. And then there is the iterative nature. Uh, the idea of having this, uh, let's say, uh, editability in a platform is for us the way of refining the models without having to start from scratch every time. Moreover, as we have seen, having a versioning capability also makes it possible for, to imagine not only to work on our own and to make uh, let's say modifications, but also to do that collaboratively and together. And then there is the large scale, which we tackled on one hand on the vectorization process of Jerusalem. It was necessary to go with uh, an automatic pipeline because the scale was too big. And secondly, for every model, we actually model them using procedural modeling. 
and for what regards the subjective reconstruction, what we use as an extension incorporates the concept of metadata and paradata, such as we can keep track of the sources that we used, but not only, also of who did the edit, why they did the edit through the comments, and when the edit was done. The idea in the future would be to make this as much as possible as a conversation and a debate around the possible appearance of an element. And this is, let's say, the complete frame. And uh, as for future works, uh, we imagine our work up until now as the core that can accommodate more and more modules, so to say. First of all, uh, what you saw was uh, an experience that we carried out with the built environment. But we would really like in the future to include additional geographic features as, uh, such as roads, rivers, or walls. And also, uh, since we actually have all these layers of information already embedded in our JSON, we see as feasible to imagine to do a color coding based on that and to visualize the difference between uh, these elements in different, uh, uh, let's say, topics. Uh, also, uh, as you saw, we have some diachronic case, uh, some diachronic cases, and what we do uh, for now is we can extract from the main models some time slots. But in the future, we would like to have this functionality to be implemented inside of our viewer, because we actually think that this would make it very much easier to explore also temporarily. Thank you. <laughs>